Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Sports Stuff Philadelphia here on LaSalle TV. We're back from another week off, of course, last weekend being Easter weekend. Everybody heads out on Thursday. But we're back here. We've got a lot of good stories to talk about because of that week off, and we've got a great panel to do so. We've got Kevin Cook, Isaac Perry III, and Tommy McIntyre down in the end. Uh, guys, we're going to start right off the top with baseball, because guess what? It counts now. I don't know how good that is because we're all Phillies fans here and the team's projected to lose 100 games. But so far, so good. They're 1-1 one one this past week with their two games so far against the Red Sox. But, I mean, obviously you're not going to lose all 162 games. But, so let's start on opening day, and let's start with the ace of this staff, Cole Hamels, who we all weren't sure what uniform he was going to be wearing because he had the quote of, of course, uh, I always thought I was going to be in this ballpark for opening day, but he never specified for which team. But let's look at the stats and how he did against the Red Sox in a Phillies uniform. Five innings pitched, four earned runs, all on solo home runs, 7.20 ERA. Guys, Cole Hamels has never had a good history of starting off well in the season, whether that's on opening day or just his first start of the season in general. Normally, he will start slow, and then he'll pick it up. But, I mean, serving up four home runs on opening day, making Citizens Bank Park that hitter-friendly park we all know it to be, is it time to panic on Cole Hamels yet? No. There's nothing to panic about. I mean, like you said, he's, he's always started off bad, and that there's 160 games left now, so it's time for uh, Cole to knuckle down and pitch better. He uh, struggled with his control a lot in that first game, so that's really where I want to see him maybe make some adjustments to and uh, hopefully win the next game. Isaac? Well, as we all know, the first, the first game of the season can actually set the tone for the entire season. Um, I didn't think Cole Hamels had a, had a particularly good game, but he's had a history of doing that. But hey, it's only one game of the season. You can't really define him exactly who he is. I think he'll bounce back. Yeah, I agree with um, Isaac and, uh, and uh, all you guys, honestly. I, I think Honestly, the, the thing with Cole Hamels right now is that he, he has a history of, of giving up solo homes, especially in Citizens Bank Park. It's just that short porch and left, is, it, really just, it really is easy to hit a home run in, in Citizens Bank Park on that short porch. And I think he's, he's had a history of doing that. So give a four, four, four solo home runs. Uh, it wasn't particularly sharp, but uh, we've seen that in the past early in the year. He, he has a, a couple weird starts early in the year. But I think he understands that this season is important for, for him because, I mean, honestly, this is going to determine probably where he ends up because, I, I, in all honesty, I think he's probably going to get traded eventually because, I mean, I don't see the Phillies, unless something miraculously they start hitting miraculously, I don't see them making the playoffs this year, and I think they're thinking this is going to be a process. We're going to have to sell. What is the best we can get for these guys? And the best we can get is hopefully meaning that Cole Hamels is playing well and other guys are playing well so that they can hopefully get some pieces for these guys. Yeah, you talked about that. And again, I mentioned his comment and how it was kind of funny that he said it straight up when he was asked about it in his press conference before the season started, oh, I always figured I'd be here on opening day. But again, he didn't specify mm -hmm. which team because, of course, the Red Sox are the team that's constantly mentioned in the Cole Hamels rumors. And of course, or that, because of that, many people thought this was an audition for the Red Red Sox, and of course that <laughs> didn't go so smooth. So I mean, again, we, we've talked about it a little bit with, again, he has the track record of not starting off so great, but how much could this possibly hurt his trade value, Kevin? Uh, I mean, it's, it's one game. He's got, he's got game, plenty yeah. of games left. And as far as the Red Sox go, a couple years ago they signed John Lackey, another pitcher who couldn't beat the Red Sox, and he joined them. So as far as it goes for the Red Sox and audition for them, I don't really think that that hurt what they see as Cole, because we all know that Cole is a dominant left-handed pitcher and a true ace. Well, also on top of that, I, he also signed a big contract too, what, uh, what two years, years ago or something ago. like yeah. that? Yeah, it's been a couple um, years. He, he's, he still has a lot of guaranteed money left in there, but you know, also if you're trading Cole Hamels, got to get a lot of value back for him, maybe a, maybe a first rounder and maybe a, maybe a, a, a Young, like, I think you got to think more in terms of prospects than draft picks yeah. at this point. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's way too far down the line, draft picks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, that, and like in baseball, like, it's so rare to ever really see base draft, draft picks. Draft picks, unless it's, yeah, exactly. It's normally that, that, prospect for That is very true, yeah. yeah but I'm, I get what you're saying. I mean, yes. Isaac. Well, I mean, like, like you're saying about like, the money situation in terms of is this going to hurt his trade value, I think that is the problem of them trading him, is the money. And that's the same thing we have with Ryan Howard. It's like yeah. money is a huge factor. When you sign that much cash, to a guy for, for many years down the line, teams are worried. I think if his contract was less, 
then teams would definitely go after him even more right now. The money is a factor for sure because I think he's going to pan out. I don't see Cole Hamels not bouncing back from this. Yeah, see, like my counter argument to that is like obviously Cole Hamels and Ryan Howard are similar in the fact that like obviously they both are still owed a lot of money, but with Cole Hamels, he's, you know where that yes. money's going. And you that's know, obviously yeah. more of a safe commodity. Yeah, exactly. Ryan, than Howard, Ryan Howard, you don't, you don't know. Right well, in uh, my opinion, well, no, in my opinion, I always felt that the Phillies and, and the Flyers as well have always been kind of notorious for giving out big contracts to people. But then when the time comes, once they come d down to the end of the road, it's hard to trade them. Well, that's yeah. what they've been doing recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for the Phillies. Yeah. I mean, but they, then they, they trade Jeff Carter. And Mike. Yeah, well, they, they yeah. send them like right away and, and then they just traded them. So oh. I don't know if they really waited. They waited when they're hot, when they actually was good yeah. to trade them, probably. <laughs> All right. Well. <laughs> Getting off the talks of money, let's get uh, on to the pitcher who pitched this past Wednesday, Aaron Harang, who signed a one-year deal. We thought, all right, he'll eat some innings. He actually had a really yeah. good outing against the Red Sox. 6.1 innings pitch, no runs allowed, eight strikeouts, two hits, and one walk. Guys, how surprising was it to see Aaron Harang handle the Red Sox bats a lot better than Cole Hamels did? It was, uh, it was pretty surprising. I mean, like you said, he's, he's actually he's turned into a journeyman over the past couple of years of his career. And... Um, the Red Sox have one of the best lineups in the league. So for him to go out and pretty much shut down the Red Sox for a number of innings, it's a good job. Well, he's a, he's a perfect definition of when your name is called, you go up there and you produce. He Somebody's is, got to pitch in that rotation. Yeah, yeah. He, is, he is a journeyman pitcher at that, but he keeps pitching games like how he did that night. He'll be around for a little while. No, yeah, it's, it's great to see him come out and, and pitch the way he did, especially after, I mean, Cole Hamels, you expect more from Cole, your, your ace, and then have a guy like Aaron Harang come in, and no one's, no one's really expecting anything from the starting staff right now, so they're just hoping to get any bright spots, and that was a huge one. Come in, really didn't have any struggles until that later inning, into the sixth inning when he got taken out with one out. Um, but uh, really, really pitched really well. I was surprised. A lot of strikeouts early. I mean, had maybe a perfect game. To, I mean, hey, man, you have hopes, <laughs> you have dreams. Yeah. No, throw, no, 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 through three. <laughs> no. But seriously, though, he was pitching really well. Yeah, I mean, Tommy, you and I were there. Of course, we were there for LaSalle College meet Edie and I. We, get, we had good uh, tickets. It was a lot of fun. But we were very surprised yes. at how Aaron Harang was handling that lineup. I mean, yeah, I mean, the only thing that really hurt him was his pitch count. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he got pulled without a lot of runs. the strikeouts. Yeah, yeah because like, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of pitches. Oh, yeah, I can't. I mean, eight strikeouts that's against great. the Red Sox? That's not bad. And, like, what was it, yeah. four or five of them through the first Yeah, night? it was like he was, had them no looking, swinging, uh, everything. It was, Filthy curveball. Yeah, it was really good. Nice yeah. yeah. That was so, a good audition, that's for sure, because yeah. that, that, that and goes for a couple one, of Phillies on the team. Yeah, I mean, well, audition. I mean, you mentioned audition. That could be, on a, if he gets hot enough, come trade deadline, that could be an audition Something. for another team. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Absolutely. if someone needs a fourth or fifth starter, mm -hmm. we need, we need a prospect. You know? mm -hmm. All right, real quick, we'll talk about, we got to bring this guy up, even though we got a save last night. Jonathan Papabon <laughs> just can't seem to keep his mouth shut, because nope. even after he gets the save in a clutch situation, even though it got a little dicey there in the ninth inning, he comes out after the game and says, I've never really been fully embraced here. I don't feel like a Philly. I'm missing back when I was with the Red Sox. My, the Red Sox run deep with me. I get that that's the organization that brought him up. I get that he won, won the series there. But why does this need to be said? Like, I don't, he wants so badly to be traded, but apparently nobody wants him, so why can't he just shut his mouth and pitch? <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I, Obviously, you're just, not a therapist. I know. Yeah, it, it just goes to the type of person that he is, the goofball of the closer that he is. Um, that's that's putting it nicely. Yes, good choice of yes. words. He's a he's a really good closer, and I'm sure someone out there wants his talent for them. But with him talking, it's making it harder for the Phillies to trade him, and it makes the fans hate him even more. I think on opening day, he might have even gotten booed when they called out his name. Wouldn't be surprising. Isaac, what do you think? He's, he's a person that always, always speaks his mind and would never choose his words wisely, nor will he ever say the right things. Um, I mean, there have been a couple of instances where, where Papelbon said, you know, hey, I didn't come here for this. He called Philly fans his little brother. He, he had grabbed his groin and <laughs> that whole incident. But uh, he, 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 he'll never learn. But, you know, if you're the Phillies, they, they actively tried to trade him all summer long, give it dating back to last year, and we're unable to do it. So I just think that I guess they're stuck with him just like Ryan Howard for a little while. Yeah. No, I mean, honestly, the statements he said are probably true. I just don't know if they have to be said. Because <laughs> also, I think as a Philly fan, when you think of Pat Bond, even being at the game against Boston, that it's like as the Boston fans are cheering him on, I'm like, oh, my gosh, 
he's like a Boston guy. Like that's almost what you think. You always think about it as a Red Sox mm-hmm. still. And I kind of and, and and even as he's been with the Phillies over the years, I think maybe because they've just been bad. And if he was on the team when we were winning, would have felt differently. But oh, just he'd be embracing a completely yeah, different way. But it's just yes. the fact we're just not winning. And I think he would be totally different if we were winning. I think oh yeah, if he, all fans together. would embrace we're, him more. If so. he was, yeah. if we were winning, he would be shutting it's his like mouth. The, he, like winning. he wouldn't be saying. That's why, this. like I think the whole thing like we talked about recently, where the Jimmy Rollins were like fans, you can't get embraced if you say stuff. If if Pat was saying this stuff, but we were winning, we wouldn't care. Yeah. Yeah. Not. Yeah. There was always that one thing: winning cures everything, and that is yeah. probably one of the most yeah. truest statements in the history of sports. If only the Phillies could win. I mean. Well, what I'm they're, just saying, like, they're projected you know, to lose a hundred plus game, but oh, yeah. we'll keep an eye on that in the last few weeks. We of sports to, I guess our season is starting to wind to a close, but now let's move on to the Philadelphia Eagles who are in off season mode and still making moves because over that, that Easter break and that, that week, they added another receiver, Miles Austin, the former Dallas Cowboy and Cleveland Brown. Let's check out his stats from last year, 12 games played, 47 catches, 568 yards, only two touchdowns, of course. Injury shortened season yet again. Not, I mean, obviously that's the status quo for Miles Austin this past couple years. Guys, who's the number one receiver, Miles Austin or Riley Cooper, and why? Uh, I guess at this point, right now, I'd say Cooper is because he's been here longer. Um, he seems like the player that Chip Kelly really likes, guy that's going to go out there and block for the running game as well as make some catches. Um, I think very easily, Austin can pass him, but. Still, I think that we have a number one receiver coming up in the draft. I'm going to throw a curveball and say our number one wide receiver is still in college. <laughs> because <you> in, in, <laughs> That's in, true. No, and the he reason may not why even I say be that, in the draft yeah. this year. <laughs> well, the reason why I say that is because, for one, I view Miles Austin as, as like an insurance policy. That mm-hmm. way, if the draft doesn't go but he's so the injury way. Prone. Well, I mean, yeah. he's, he's, he's not going to come in here and be your number the number, you know, number uh, one guy, yeah, yeah, because I mean, he might the, have to be, but <laughs> I was gonna say he might be no, the Jordan Matthews fault. Yeah, yeah, that's I think he's saying though. That's what, that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's, yeah. well, because Jordan Matthews yeah. is going to be your slot receiver. Receiver. I'm yeah. going to assume that uh-huh. Riley Cooper is going to be your number four. Yeah. So I Josh think, Huff might be your number two. I think Jordan Matthews is going to be probably the best receiver, and then it's just a matter of where you place him. Because I, th- I like yeah, his potential. Slot I think Jordan Matthews mm-hmm. can be a really solid so, piece if you use him correctly. Yeah, I think in the slot though. Yeah, I think right now it would it be like. I guess Cooper want Cooper and Austin on the outside, uh, Matthews in the slot, and Huff you could put in wherever. They like Huff. It's just a matter of can he get his head together. Right? And they like him as a kick yeah, returner. Yeah, too. yeah. He mm-hmm. has skill. It's just like he fumbles and stuff. So he, it's still time to see, I guess. And that could still be rookie Jenner, yeah, too. Still, yeah. Yeah. I still don't see where Riley Cooper fit. I mean, like, I'll be honest with you. I didn't jump on the bandwagon when Riley Cooper had, like, 800 yards what, yes. two years ago. I still felt like he still had something else to, to prove than last year. Mm-hmm. He had a he – had a, Average year, just yeah. mainly because of Macklin and Jordan Matthews yes. was coming along. So, I mean, we'll see when the time comes. Yeah, yeah and I think a, a pro of Riley Cooper is his blocking ability. Yes. yes. I mean, mm-hmm. he may not always make the, those big catches, and some may argue that's because Nick Foles isn't the quarterback anymore. Mm-hmm. Yes. But he does make the, those key blocks for whoever's running the ball, whether that's Darren Sproles, whether it will soon to be DeMarco Murray, soon to be Ryan Matthews, maybe Chris Bolk if for some reason he's still on this team. I, I like Chris Bolk. I like Chris yeah. Bolk too, mm-hmm. but – there's too many good running backs. Pick your poison. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, but I, I think that's one of the reasons I like Cooper on this team. And obviously, I'm not crazy about that five year contract, but I like his blocking ability. I, and if he just puts his head down and d- does that, he made some kind of offhand comments last year. But again, if he just keeps his head down, make, makes the blocks, occasionally makes a good catch, I have no problem with him. But now, Speaking of keeping your mouth shut, let's go to LaShawn McCoy in Buffalo. Why does this guy feel the need to dig all this up now? Like, making comments about how the Buffalo Bills have more of an NFL feel than the Eagles, how Chip Kelly apparently doesn't respect the stars. Uh, Guys, is Shady showing his true colors, or do you think he's just trying to stir the pot a little bit? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, we saw Shady had the incident with the waiter. Uh, right before he 20 left, twenty cent there. tip. Yes, um, <laughs> oh, gosh, I know. and I mean he's he's constantly been talking since he left, and that could be a little bit of bad blood. So I think he's just mad that he isn't in Philly and he's left for Buffalo and what probably isn't greener pastures out there. We'll see. I think this is actually making him look bad. If anything else, um, when you look at at what he did, I mean in two thousand and thirteen. Winning the Russian title, 2014, breaking the Russian record. I just think that that he, it's really making him look bad 
because that trade happened over a month ago. Fingers slow talking like crazy. I think that the number, re re number one reason why he's really upset is because he got traded to a team yeah. that's not going to win. And plus, on top of that, he is, he is in a division with a future Hall of Fame quarterback in Tom Brady. Yeah. The Dolphins got better, and the Jets are going to be there when it's all said and done. So where do the Bills fit there? Exactly. You know, and, and, and plus, he's an Andy Reid guy. So, so I think that's another thing that, that some people don't, don't know is that he's an Andy Reid guy. He drafted him. So, so would you have LaShawn McCoy or, or would you have Kiko Alonso or Byron Maxwell? Obviously, I choose the latter. Well, yeah, I mean, but I'm going to kind of disagree about, like, Buffalo not being the best team because they did a lot of retooling, too, and, like, their offense is going to be a lot Watkins. better with, obviously, with it's one with the defense is very good. But two, it's just a matter uh, of – Yeah, their defense is already good. Offensive line, though, I mean, they still got a problem. Their offensive line, line might be a little shaky, but and now that you have Percy Harvin as, a, as an, another attraction with uh, – Oh, yeah, I just, I'm just saying, Sammy like, Watkins. Look, yeah, look at Sammy Watkins. You look yeah. at last year. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, what, what was the biggest thing on LaShawn McCoy last year? Is like he had a he was really not good early in the year. And mm -hmm. what was it because of the offensive line problems? Wasn't that good late in the year either? Yeah, I mean, he got better though. Let's be. I mean, he oh, did get better. He got better. But but the offensive line was a problem. And if that's a problem in Buffalo, I mean, he's still a ridiculously great running back. But it's like one of the best in the league, arguably maybe the best running back in the league if he's doing what he's supposed to do. But it's just offensive line troubles are definitely an interesting factor into it. Yeah, and with all this in mind, we got to keep in mind, too, that the Bills come here to play this year. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about all this perfect timing. Tommy, we'll start with you. The boos have to rain down on LaShawn McCoy at this point, right? It's like, I, I feel bad because like, LaShawn McCoy is like my favorite player with the Eagles. So it's, it's been tough, all these trades happening with all these guys. Um, I hope they don't boo him. I mean, I don't think, I mean, because I think a lot of the Eagles fans are still confused what's going on with, <laughs> with the Eagles itself. So it's like, I think it's going to be kind of mixed probably. It's just, it's different. He's not like Brian Westbrook in the fact that Westbrook had all those runs to like the playoff runs. And I think that's the one thing with LaShawn McCoy. Not only that, but Westbrook didn't say anything Westbrook, either. I know, <laughs> but I think the difference is like when you look at, when you look at the totals that LaShawn McCoy is the best, like in terms of rushing and stuff, but he never had that playoff history as much yeah. as Westbrook did. And that, and that grittiness of all those years, however we want to look at the Donovan McNabb years, Andy Reid years, yeah. that was re amazing to see in terms of all those years of getting back to the, and all those playoff runs, NFC Championship, and eventually the Super Bowl. So those are great runs. Well, I let me mean, ask you a question. Who, who is Buffalo's quarterback? They haven't had a quarterback Manuel. since Jim. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't, I mean, in I, but that doesn't matter. I, I could be back there and Jim I could Kelly. hand the ball to LaShawn McCoy. Well, yeah, I know, you got to yeah. have some kind of like, you can't just be like, the defense is going to know you're handing off to LaShawn McCoy. Yeah, 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 but that's the thing. That's, I don't know. I, you need a quarterback in this league. We've seen the Eagles, they need a quarterback. Yeah, in this but league, I think so. if EJ Manuel can be healthy and the offensive line can at least somewhat keep him up, I think. He'll be better than people think. I mean, I know we had the rotation of Kyle Lorton and all that, them in Buffalo this past year, but if E.J. Manuel can stay healthy, I think he could somewhat try Lorton, to regain the I think form. Kyle Lorton was better than E.J. Manuel was ever going to be, though. Kyle Lorton's always been a... I don't know about that. No, he retired, he, didn't he? Or yeah, no, but I'm okay, saying, okay. like, I think Kyle Lorton... I don't think E.J. Manuel's ever going to surpass a Kyle Lorton skill set in the league. I just <laughs> don't see it. That's a bold statement. <laughs> no, I mean, Kyle Lorton wasn't bad, though. Kyle I'm not saying Kyle Lorton was bad. Kyle Lorton was a starter in the league for a little bit. So it's not like... And he was solid. For Jake Cutler. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I feel that Kyle Lorton... It was a solid guy, and I think A.J. Manuel's uh, it, the best he could be is around that, that skill set. All right, this almost turned into Buffalo sports. I'm just saying. I, I, I think that was partially my fault, but nevertheless, we'll see what happens when LaShawn McCoy comes into Philadelphia next football season. But now we move on to the Philadelphia 76ers. We haven't talked Sixers in a few weeks because we know why, but let's talk about Nerlens Noel because even though it's been a couple weeks now, he had a really good month of March, so let's highlight it. 14.2 points per game, 11.2 rebounds per game, 2.4 steals per game, and 2.2 blocks per game. Now, I believe he was Rookie of the Month. If not, he was close enough for, for March. He had a re really good pace. Now, he's got that eye injury that he's battling with now here in April. But with this in mind, if somehow in the, these last couple games he could possibly string something like this together again, Tommy, I'll start with you. How possible do you think it could be that Nerlens Noel could – maybe unseat Andrew Wiggins as Rookie of the Year favorite. Uh, I don't, I mean, there's really, what, we have like four or five games left in the yeah, year. It's true. pretty much, I mean, you have to realize that Andrew Wiggins has won Rookie of the Month like four or five times. That's true. It's just, it's, it's, I think if he started the season like this, it was possible because then they would have saw it earlier. But I think now it's just like, Andrew, you have to realize Andrew Wiggins, Andrew Wiggins came in the, this, he's an actual rookie. He like, this is his first year even like, 
with the team at all. Like Nuno's Noel had a process of really traveling with the team before he had to play. He's he's tearing a, your ACL. He'll do that. <laughs> he had a, he's a veteran in this league without actually playing because he understands the game now. He's traveled with the team. This is Wigan's first year, and he's playing. I mean, he's playing fairly well. He's not helping the team like like efficiency wise. Probably my wins above replacement. Those kind of things right now. But Wigan's upside is very great. And I think you have to give it to him for that. And I also think New Orleans Wells' upside is very great. If he can figure out how to shoot a little bit better, he can be very great. But I think this year, you got to give it to Andrew Wiggins. Just for the hype alone, and I think he's, he's lived up to – he's been, I mean, average of 60 points a game. Pretty yeah, solid it's a shame he's out there in Minnesota. Yeah, but I think that's I mean, if he's thing. putting up good numbers out there, he deserves it. Yes. Isaac? If, I really don't think that he's going to win Rookie of the Year. Will he gain consideration? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but – he has made his case for, for being the long-term future for the team. I just wish we had seen this earlier, earlier during the, 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 the beginning half of the season, you know, on to now. But I'm really glad he did pick it up because had he not picked it up, then, then I would have questioned the Sixers, you know, a little bit, not a lot, but, you know, well, you know, I, I think it he's helps the process of this rebuild, though, because when you're finally starting to see, wow, this guy has some talent here. You go into this draft, we get another star, maybe top four pick. It could really, it, few, this plan, the Sam Hickey plan is starting to, like, we see some op, like, of options right now. So let's go into that, and let's, look at, let's take a look at how the three, like, top guys who are being considered for this draft class, at least the ones who are in college, not in China right now, are are playing or had did play excuse me in the NCAA tournament you got Jalil Okafor who had 27.8 minutes per game 15 points per game 5.6 rebounds a game Carl Anthony Towns of Kentucky who had 23.4 minutes per game 14.2 points per game and 6.8 rebounds a game and then of course obviously the guard of those three the guy who only played two games D'Angelo Russell for Ohio State 40.5 minutes per game but 18.5 points per game and 6.5 rebound ounce per game now, let's focus on the big, and Kevin, we'll start with you with this, with Okafor and with Carl Anthony Towns. There are rumors about if the Sixers get that top pick, maybe the possibility exists if they want to draft Okafor that they trade Noel and try to get mm -hmm. a, a guard or a swing man through, through there. Would you want to see them maybe try to use Noel as trade bait, or do you think they should stay loyal and try to follow through with Noel? I really like what Noel is doing, um, but with that being said, uh, if they can acquire somebody better like than what they can get in the draft with Noel than what rather than what they can do via the draft, uh, I'd definitely go down that route. But for me, I think that if you end up getting one of those top two picks, you're going to acquire you're going to be more likely to get a better talent return by trading down and drafting either Moutier from China or D'Angelo Russell. Tommy, real quick, what do you think? Um, I really like, um, I think Carl Anthony Towns is the best player in this draft. I think, I think Okafor has kind of fallen off because of the fact that he, his athleticism isn't as much, and I think he's going to be the number one pick, and if the, if the Eagles, pardon me, Sixers get, <laughs> Sixers get the number one pick, they're taking him. It doesn't matter anything else. They're Carl taking Anthony Carl Anthony Towns? He has ridiculous upside. I think he may be better. He's a local he's, guy too, right? I, I'm not positive about that. Mm, but, I yeah, I think he is. That. He is. Yeah. He is. And uh, he's better than Nerlens Noel if he comes. I think he has a be he can shoot the lights out for a guy his size. Mm -hmm. He shoots like 85% from the line and can really shoot a, like a mid-range jumper. All right. Well, again, we're not Sam Hankey, and Sam Hankey surprised us before. So we'll see what happens when draft day comes. Of course, the Sixers have to finish their season first, and then the lottery has to happen. That should be fun. But now let's go on to fun here at the Fast Five. Of course, our favorite segment here, five rapid-fire questions for the panel. Tommy, we start with you. The Masters starts today. Who are some of your top picks, Mr. Golf Insider? I think that uh, you got to give Bubba Watson. I mean, the guy's defending champ. He's won two of the last three Masters. You, you got to give Bubba Watson uh, probably the, the lead right now to win it just because he has so much length and is be able to drive the ball so far on those par fives, get eagle opportunities. Uh, Rory, McElroy, Rory McElroy, excuse me. Uh, I think he's the next guy uh, just because he's going for that Grand Slam to get that Master jacket. And then uh, I think you got to add in, I'm probably, who else could you probably add in there? I think those are my top two. I'll give you two. I'm not going to rush anyone. You know what? That's fair. I, way more golf knowledge than I have. Uh, Kevin Cook, who leaves the Philadelphia Phillies first? Cole Hamels, Ben Revere, Chase Utley, or Jonathan Papelbon? Well, that's a good one. Wow. Uh, I guess Ben Revere, I guess I would say. I'd hope it would be Papelbon, but I'd say Ben Revere is the one to go. I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised. All right, Tommy. Jeff Francoeur, who, of course, hit a home run Last night, that director Eddie Dunn called. I got your shout out, Eddie. You're welcome. Uh, 
Uh, he has an interesting nickname, Frenchie. I don't know why exactly, I guess just because Frank is French. Do you have any cool nicknames? And if so, can you share? Um, I know there's one that your, one, one of your roommates calls you. Team Money McIntyre? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. I, I yeah. don't know. Can you give yourself a nickname? I never gave myself a nickname. Well, I'm just saying so in general, just, do you have a nickname? They say Team Money. I say what's up. <laughs> 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 I respond to it. You do Team respond Mac, to Team I mean, whatever you got. As long as you don't call me like something random, I mean, I'll respond. <laughs> I don't know what else I'd call you. I, uh, I mean, Isaac. I got bullied in high school. I mean, you could get called anything. <laughs> We're not going to cover that. <laughs> Isaac, Remets, Remets real quick, we got to move. Isaac, over <laughs> under 20 wins for the Sixers next year. Noel, Three, Noel and two, being a shooter, over 20. One. Over 20? Yep. All right, they're going to have to take that step forward. And finally, Kevin, Marcus Hayes said in a really random article that because of this Flyers craziness, they have to trade Jeru and Voracek to try to facelift the team and get better. Quickly, do you agree? Why why not? Uh, no. Uh, I think that they're really only a couple pieces away, one of which is defensemen, and they have a couple coming up. You know what? That's a fair point. All right, so that does it for this week. But... You can always catch up with us on social media. We're always there. You can see us on Facebook, facebook.com slash sports of Philadelphia, or you can hit LaSalle TV on Twitter or uh, via email. You can see all our full episode oats on you, YouTube, wherever you are. Uh, and so that does it for us here today. For Tommy, for Isaac, and for Kevin, I'm Tyler Harper. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next time.